exclusive to our MLB YouTube channel. Picks, predictions, and analysis across the best value MLB games daily, Monday to Friday, live at 12 p.m. Eastern. So subscribe, hit that bell, and never miss a show. Bet US, where the game begins. And a good Monday to you. Welcome back. This is the MLB Show here on BetUS TV. TC Martin along with Mark Borchard, the base winner, and of course, Jeff Nadu. And we are glad to have you with us here again on the MLB Show. We go Monday through Friday, 12 noon Eastern time, handicapping some baseball winners and talking all about Major League Baseball. And as we know, we love for you to, to like and subscribe to this channel and the show right here. Real simple. Just go ahead and hit that bell. You'll get the notifications when we go live like we are right now. Gentlemen, how are we doing? It was a very, very busy sports weekend all the way around from uh, NBA playoffs to Major League Baseball to the Kentucky Derby, the huge upset, uh, huge upset boxing here in Las Vegas as well, too. It was a a wild, crazy weekend, and uh, hopefully we got enough time to uh, watch and bet some baseball as well, too. Yeah, I, I, I bet a lot of baseball this weekend, and I was on Kevin Gaussman on Saturday. That was nice. And I actually played a three-team parlay yesterday, Angels and Yankees in the first game and the Twins, and that came, that came through uh, on the good side. So that was good. I played a couple overs that, that didn't hit, and uh, it's still a little concerning on what's going on with, uh, with the run-scoring environment in Major League Baseball. But you got, at some point, you got to start playing the overs because these, these unders are getting just set so low. So, yeah, other than that, it was a good weekend. I would, I, I would imagine you probably know somebody that hit the Kentucky Derby uh, exact at TC. I would imagine there would be some smart guy that put, uh, to put the uh, favorite on the bottom in a, in, a, in a wheel or something like that. You know, what's funny about that is, uh, so I was at actually one of the sports books watching um, that. And uh, the moment that race was over, usually see people just take a beeline towards the cashier to cash their tickets. Nobody was going to the window to cash the tickets. It was pretty, pretty crazy. I said, okay, well, I think I'll, now's a good time for me to step up and go bet this basketball game a little bit later uh, with the Warriors. But yeah, it was... Uh, it was crazy. Actually, I do know someone. It was actually um, a friend of mine who has a, a very popular handicapping service. His wife bet the long shot, uh, bet 20 across on, uh, on the 80 to 1 shot. So she cashed in. Wow. It, was just a, it was just a numbers game for her because she liked uh, the the 21 horse in this case. But but this is horse racing. It's crazy. But I don't think anybody anticipated that we were going to get a Kentucky Derby like that. And I don't know if you guys are horse players or what, but uh, it was definitely one for the ages. Yeah, no, I just I, th- I thought that the favorite was the second horse, you know, that the, the horse it placed. And so I would think that there would be a, a contingent of guys that would, you know, just say, okay, well, I'm going to put the favorite on the bottom and hope a long right. shot comes in. But uh, I, I guess from, from what I heard is that that was a, a horse that kind of came in at the end. So maybe people had their bets in already before that horse, you know, got in the field. I, I'm not sure about that, though. No. So the, the way that worked was, and that's why he was a 21. So you had a 20-horse field, but then you had two scratches that happened like on Thursday. So they added these two two horses. So people were betting, you know, had the opportunity to bet because once the field is set, the field is set. So the scratches, once a scratch occurs, um, you know, on Saturday morning, that they just shortened the field a little bit. But no, there were two horses that were added, and Rich Strike was one of those uh, that got added. But it's funny you bring that up because we talked about this on my show on Friday where we we handicapped this race, and um, we we're talking about using the all button. You know, but when you have 21, 22 horses in a field like this, it's tough. It can get very, very expensive to do the all button. So what you try to do as a handicapper is you try to eliminate maybe the four or five horses that have no business being in the race. I see. And then you can do it. And unfortunately, I think that's what a lot of people did. They said, well, this horse has got no shot, so let's don't waste the money. But because you can do the all button if you have a 10 horse field or a 12 horse field or, you know, even less than that, that is, doesn't get to be that expensive. So if you do a two dollar box uh, with epicenter to all, then all with epicenter. Yeah. What, what is that like? Uh, for, you have to bets? do the math, though. So 40 then, yeah, bets. 12, 12, yeah. So basically, you know, four, 44 times 
you know, times your two dollars. So you you know, it'd be like eighty eight dollars. You'd be invested in that, but not bad because you're you're bringing home thousands of dollars on the return. I caught your show, TC. It was great. I I loved your interview with Mattress Mac. That was that was well done. And and oh, you had Marco you. on. Marco's an old friend of mine. I've I've gotten some spring training games with him out here. So it was fun. Yeah, that's great. Well, yeah, I invite everybody to to catch the show Monday through Friday here, two to four p.m. You can always uh, catch it at tcmartinshow.com. And Mattress Mac, as you said, he bet Epicenter, and Mac thought he had the winner all the way to the end. And Epicenter uh, finished second, and Mattress Mac lost two point six million dollars on you know being nosed out there at the end so kind of feel bad for him so. small change for him though probably That's right it. jeff what's going on buddy how's your weekend Don, doing well the problem with that horse winning as well is you're going to have a lot of you know smaller amateur players that are just going to play it because oh it's the you know, longest shot in the field like the you know the mothers in america that just feel like betting on it or whatever so i'm sure it wasn't a huge loss but you know again you would have hoped that like the second or third uh, worst odds one because yeah. no one really bet those horses you either have obviously the top horses you'll have the bottom horse where people just bet it to bet it but uh yeah either way uh look I, i'm not going to say anything about mattress mac i have no issue with the guy personally but the guy never wins i mean why, why are we why do we constantly this guy does not win he ever. wins in life though i think that his furniture store probably right, is, is a winner <laughs> right, and he's a smart marketing guy like i'll give him that we yeah, it's funny because uh t um who was it? To TJ and I, uh, our old uh, basketballs, who you know, TC. Him and I used to argue about this because me and a character that were on that show used to talk negatively about Mattress Mac all the time because we didn't understand why he always gets talked about. But I guess it's because he bets so much. But he doesn't really lose. That's the thing about it right. because he, he loses per se, but he doesn't really lose because he kind of bets the other side in his giveaways and stuff. So it's... Yeah. And remember, all these are hedge bets for the most part that we hear about because he, he does the promotions with the Super Bowl and then the Astros winning the World Series. So he'll hedge off because he offers uh, anybody who buys more than $3,000 worth of furniture, he'll offer them a full refund. Uh, so that's what he's doing. So he's got all that money he's he would refund, like say if the Astros won the World Series like last year or if the favorite wins at Kentucky Derby. So, um, you know, mm -hmm. that way he, he hedges off in that way. But... Uh, you know, don't be fooled here, guys. Mattress Mac has a couple different accounts here in Las Vegas and a couple in Louisiana, a couple of these other places. He does like to fire. I can let you come on. Does. Don't try to don't try to start saying that he's a sharp. It's not, not saying he's a sharp. I mean, just because guys have money, Jeff, as you know, doesn't know. mean they're sharps. You know, no, <laughs> absolutely. That's usually the the sure fire sign that they're not sharp. Uh, by right. uh, yeah. if you know who they are, as like if they come constantly talk about. This person bet this. Look, bookmakers are not gonna, you know, they're just not gonna put that info out if if they're if they're they're actually. How how many guys do we know out there that loses two point six million dollars on an event, whether it's a race or a game? And he says, "Well, I'm just gonna pull up uh, my, my big boy britches," and he goes, "I'll go back to work tomorrow." And that's exactly what he said after that race. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, it's, uh, I mean, look, if you had the, you know, let's say Epicenter or Messi or any of those horses, the ones that should have been there, you know, that's a rough loss. I mean, I'll give it to the the jockey, uh, Sonny Leone, I believe is his name. Yeah. I mean, that was an incredible ride. I mean, I mean you, you look at the upper, the upper drone shot of it. I mean, you know, he just kind of took a shot. I think he thought to himself, you know what? F it. Like, I'm going to just do this. You know, I'm, I'm going to, I'm going to do what I can do and I'm on the edge and I can, I can pass everybody. And, you know, I, I didn't see him coming, and I'll admit I had a I had a pick four. That was the only loss I had. Um, yeah. You know, and and, I, and I'm I had I didn't do the all. I wish I would have looking back because there I don't bet horses a ton. TC I bet pick fours and pick fives right. occasionally, and I'll I'll uh, I'll say to myself, look, I'm going to spend two, three, four hundred dollars on this ticket because the opportunity is winning back. I mean, tens of thousands. Yeah. And if if I'd have just hit the all, I I mean, I'd be I don't know if I'd be on the show. I might have quit and just. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, be on permanent vacation you know, in, in the islands. That's where Jeff would be. And that's the thing about the Kentucky Derby. And we talk about this. It, it is it is so great for the exotics because you have such a huge, you know, uh, field here. And a lot of these horses, again, they're three year olds, and most of them only have maybe two, three, or four starts. And so, from a handicapping perspective, I mean, it is the race that you can really hit on these exotics. But no one saw the eight to one shot coming. And like I said, it was a masterful ride by the jockey because 
He was there on the rail, saw the opening, and jet through there. I mean, it was masterful. Now, here's the big question here, guys. And horse racing really needs this. I mean, this is a great shot in the arm for horse racing. But now, will this horse come back and, and partake in the Preakness? Because a lot of times, you know, these horses are spent and, and they don't run them like they used to. And it would be kind of a travesty if this horse doesn't even run in the Preakness because now – the Preakness and definitely the Belmont. There, there's, there's nothing left to. Listen, to really I, I think, I think if you're the owners of this horse, and as far as I know, this horse was sold for like thirty thousand dollars. You could yeah, have bought claimer. this horse. Yeah, yeah, you could have bought this horse on the cheap. Uh, and, and as someone that, uh, like, I have friends of mine that they buy, you know, horses at Penn National and things like that. You know, this is kind of that level of horse. I mean, this is kind of an incredible. Look, if this horse were to win the Triple Crown, this would be the greatest uh, story in the history of sports, probably. I mean, it's 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 incredible, really. But you know, the only reason I and I'll tell you this: this is the one thing that I hate about the Kentucky Derby, is the amount of horses they have in the field. I mean, look, if that's a fifteen horse field, I- I'm hitting the all button there. 21 right. horses? I mean, 20 horses? That's a different story. So, yeah, I, I hope it does. seems like their ownership are pretty uh, – per, the owner, the horse's ownership are pretty lax, and they're going to just kind of go for it and take a shot. So, mm-hmm. yeah, I agree with you there. All right. All right. Good stuff there. All right. Uh, busy weekend. Uh, we talked some baseball, and uh, let's uh, get cracking here on today's games. Not a full schedule. We do have uh, a couple rainouts uh they're going to be made up today, so we've got some early morning games. So let's uh, dive into the card here. And before we do that, let's uh, take a look at the uh, updated record. Friday, we really didn't have uh, you know, much of a schedule to talk about. I'm fighting back, boys. Yeah, Jeff got a big victory on, on, on Friday, but I mean, none of us really had a whole bunch of action because we all had rainouts. I mean, the Toronto game, we all had action on that. That got rained out. The Yankees rained out. I mean, it was, it, was a, it was a crazy Friday. But um, we got a little better better weather over the weekend. We'll see if we get some better weather across the country here coming up today. But uh, there we go. There are your records. I'm at uh, 25 and 15. Jeff battling back, like he says, coming down the stretch, uh, going to the whip. uh, 11 and 15, base winner at 22 and 20. All right, guys, let's uh, talk about today's action. Let's start it off with the Milwaukee Brewers and the Cincinnati Reds. The Reds at 5 and 23. Uh, continue to have their struggles. The Brewers, uh, $1.65 favorite in this game. The total in this one at uh, seven and a half. Um, I'm going to take a shot with the Brewers in this game, guys. And, uh, you know, Brandon Woodruff is a guy that's got really good stuff. I know that uh, he's gotten lit up a couple times this year, and his ERA is pretty high. But in his last start against the Cincinnati Reds, this guy had 12 strikeouts in five and two-thirds. And let's, like, look at this for a second. Of the 17 outs that he recorded, 12 of them were strikeouts. And really, he looked pretty masterful uh, in that game against Cincinnati. He's going to bounce back against them uh, today. And, uh, you know, for me, this is also uh, kind of a play against Luis Castillo. Castillo has been injured. He's going to be making his first start. Uh, He's coming off that shoulder surgery. I've never really been a Castillo fan. Uh, His start, you know, keeps getting pushed back here. He was actually supposed to make his first start going back about three weeks ago. Then it got pushed back again and again. I'm not sure this guy is completely healthy, and I think it's a good spot for the Brewers here. And again, you know, anytime you're playing against the Reds, you're going to lay a little heavy juice here. But again, I think it's a pretty good spot uh, uh, for Woodruff. I really like his stuff. It can be electric. I'm banking on that uh, he has a good one today um, against the Reds. Uh, Jeff, some thoughts on this game? You know, it's interesting. I mean, it, it kind of goes to show you how bad maybe the Pirates could be by losing, what, two out of three over the weekend to the lowly Reds. Uh, but I'll tell you right now, and I'm just saying, I, look, I like the Brewers. Obviously, I think long term they're a solid team. I had a little trouble with them at the beginning of the season, but they've been playing well. This is not the greatest time, I guess, if you want to fade the Reds. If you're one of those, I'm going to fade the Reds every night. You've lost the last couple. They are hitting right now. I mean, look at over the weekend. It's seven, nine, and I think five runs uh, in the three games. That's you know, that's good for them. That's that's elite level stuff for them. Um, yeah, I, listen, I, I think if every game you bet against the Reds, you'll make money. Um, I actually kind of like Castillo, but you're right. He hasn't pitched for a while. You'd have to imagine he's ready to go. I don't think this is like we're going to throw him out and see what we have. We don't know if he's a good pitcher or not. He's got stuff. I mean, he's a, he you know, throws hard. He's He's still pretty young, and and we haven't seen him in a while, so he's definitely ready. And look, it really depends about how much you like him. I like him long term, but yeah, I'm out on this. I I don't hate it. I don't love it. I just don't really want to fade. Uh, I don't want to bet the Brewers, and 
Like, I think right now the Reds are playing better. If yeah, you they are. Yeah, and you figure they're going to you know, win some games here, you know, down the road. And uh, Castillo's going to be on a pitch count today. He may only go 60, 65 pitches. So uh, that's it. And, and I will say this uh, in advance here, uh, guys. I'm not crazy about this card here, you know, today. But obviously we've got to, you know, make some selections here. So uh, I'll, I will take a shot, you know, with the Brewers banking on their offense. Uh, base winner, some thoughts on this from the pitching perspective? Yeah, I think it's a good play. I mean... Castillo actually rates at 25th out of 150 pitchers in my rankings, but Woodruff's eighth. And if you look at his stuff plus, it's been pretty good this year. Uh, he's an 81% stuff plus. His location has been pretty much elite at 96 in the 96th percentile. And one of the things that I like about this is if you look at his long-term numbers, uh, if, if you look at, at – where he ranks in my three metric chart, he's the number one guy when you're just taking a look at swinging strike percentage, hard hit per nine, and expected walk percentage. And that's based on balls divided by pitchers or pitches. And he's had 18 starts since July 9th. And he is the number one pitcher out of 216 pitchers. So it's really hard not to like Woodruff. I know he had a he had kind of a five percent percentile start his first start of the year. But the rest of his starts have been pretty good. I mean, he goes 94 percentile, 81 percentile, 66, and then 92 percentile his last time out. So I think he's hard to bet against. I think you'll probably get Hayter and Williams out of the bullpen. That's pretty crucial. And like you said, Castillo probably is not going to go deep into the game. So how much do you like that Cincinnati bullpen? Uh, offensively, a big edge for Milwaukee. So I have it priced minus 175. There's a little bit of value there, TC. All right, let's lock it in. Uh, I'll take the, a shot with the Milwaukee Brewers. Take with Brandon Woodruff, uh, lane uh, 165. All right, next up, uh, the Oakland A's and the Detroit Tigers. And this is a battle of two teams that are really going backwards right now. And I had to put this game on the docket to talk about here just for the fact is Paul Blackburn was pitching. And, of course, as anyone knows who follows the show – this has been a, a topic of conversation with all three of us with Paul Blackburn. Jeff and I are much higher on Blackburn than uh, the base winner is. Uh, but uh, he will go against Michael Pineda today. And uh, the A's and the Tigers and the Tigers, a $1.18 favorite. The Tigers coming off a uh, sweep at Houston. And they've lost five in a row. The Oakland A's have lost nine in a row here. The total in this game, a low one at uh, seven. Uh, Jeff, uh, your thoughts about Blackburn and Pineda? Yeah, I, I'm back in Blackburn. I, I've backed him a time or two already, uh, and, and I'm I'm going to go back to the well again. Listen, there are some concerns here, but I'm not big on Detroit's lineup. And in fact, as long as they're not facing a lefty, I'm not at all worried about their lineup. So I'm not worried there. Um, you know, Mark is. You know, I'm sure Mark in his breakdown will tell us how you know his his ASAB or whatever the hell he's talking about is you know good, and, he, and he's you know. He's been good against Baltimore and teams like that. But let's remember, he's been good against Toronto. He's been good against San Francisco. He's been good against Tampa. All very solid teams. Given up two earned runs or less in every one. In fact, in two of his four starts, he has not given up a run. Now, I know we're only going to get Blackburn probably for five or six innings here. And I'm going to have to worry a bit about Oakland's bullpen and their lack of scoring runs. But I have to worry about the same things with um, the uh, Detroit Tigers and their inability to hit, their inability to keep leads. Listen, I'm going to tell you one thing. And it was one of the worst beats I've had over the last six months uh, Last uh, on Saturday, actually. I thought uh, Detroit was in a terrific spot, get about 170 against Houston, okay? Uh, they were up 2-1 uh, going into the eighth inning, uh, and naturally, Michael Fulmer comes in and blows it, you know, and they lose 3-2. It's just, you had to feel like it was going to happen, and that's the problem that I'm facing here in this game. Uh, but I got the better starting pitcher. I've had some decent success at times with Blackburn. I like him a lot. I'm going to back him here in a plus money spot. Uh, you know, Detroit's not worrying me here. Yeah. Okay, uh, base winner. Go ahead. I know you've well, been on the anti-Paul Blackburn. So well, go all, I gotta, all I got to say about Oakland is you asked me what my favorite team was. I think it was on the Friday show. And I said Oakland, Oakland, and Paul Blackburn. And ever since I did that, I, I really think that they, they they have lost nine straight, and they that started that day when I said I lo I loved Oakland as my favorite team, you know, kind of sarcastically. But uh, I don't know. I'm not sold on Blackburn yet, and and I will say that, and and admittedly, we'll say when will you be? I mean, when he's eight and zero, it's and gonna, it's going to take probably I would say 
uh, maybe three or four more starts. I mean, he's he really hasn't exhibited that much this year by my metrics. So if you look, his first start, 52nd percentile. Okay, well, it's better than what he averaged last year, which was in the teen percentile wise. And then if you look at 61st percentile, okay, he's getting a little bit better. Then he dropped down 15 percentile. The last two starts have been good, 75th percentile, 74th percentile. But I'm not sold on the guy. I mean, five starts doesn't make a pitcher in my book. I've, I've got to have probably a sample. Of, uh, gosh, I'd, li- I'd like to use 30 games. I have this other – this one chart goes back to last June. But I really honestly think that's a little bit short of a sample uh, for this guy. And the only thing that would change my mind, Jeff, is – and you asked me, well, how much does it take? Well, on a guy like Kyle Wright, which we've talked about extensively on the show, who definitely has – like two pitches that he's totally redesigned. Luzardo, I've talked about uh, Jesus Luzardo as well. You know, these guys have really redesigned their arsenal, and there's really not much in Blackburn's arsenal that indicates the guy's different than he was last year, other than he's just getting a little lucky. He does have a cutter that he's using. He uses about 20% of the time, and I, you would think, well, now oh, he's different. He's got a cutter. But if you look at the, his, his stuff plus, and this includes his cutter, it's worse than it was last year. It's at 50, in the 15th percentile. And last year he was in the 19th percentile. So I don't think that there's a lot to like yet for me on, on Paul Blackburn. The other thing that, that I, is important in this game is he's only, he's only faced two batters the third time through the lineup. So he's only going to face the lineup two times through. You're going to get the wonderful Oakland bullpen. And uh, I think that that Oakland bullpen's like one of the worst in baseball, 26 out of, out of my th- uh, 30 bullpen ratings. Now, having said that, I'm not a huge fan of Michael uh, Michael Pineda either. So, like, you know, if you look at his game log, if you look at his all his starts, I mean, it's pretty it's it's pretty amazing. This guy has a consistency to allow hard hit contact every time he goes to the mound. So, I'm not I'm not I mean, really double digit like below average hard hit contact in his all of his starts since uh, July 21st of last year. I mean, it's pretty amazing. I I've, I've never seen anything like that. So I'm not going to play on Detroit. I'm going to play the over here. I think it's set set a little bit low. I've got it at 7.5 runs, and uh, it's set at 7. And it's hard to like Oakland and Detroit's offense. I mean, there's some things in the Oakland offense that look better. They're hard hit per nine. Their barrel rate's a little bit better. Uh, But they're just this pitching so bad, and I just think a a Blackburn Pineda 7 is too low. I'm going to play the over here in this game. Yeah, but you the know, pitching's really. not so so bad, Mark. I mean, I don't know when you're gonna. You know, and I listen. It's interesting because you don't give Blackburn respect, but you'll tell us that you're know, that kid for the uh, McClanahan, who you're only basing that off of his starts this year. Um, not necessarily. He had a good last year too. So there's there's actually 365 days of data where I'm comparing these guys. So 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 you're not right about that. Sorry. Blackburn is a killer, Mark. Uh, the sooner you realize that, the better. All right, and you're going to keep realizing it tonight when he throws one run over seven innings. When he goes through the lineup twice and they pull him in the at, at the end of the fourth inning, and you got to rely on the Oakland bullpen to win your bet. I mean, uh-huh. I don't know, but maybe they're so, not as bad as the Detroit bullpen. They're both pretty bad, so maybe maybe you'll you'll win there. So as you guys know, I've been on Blackburn the last couple of times, and it was in that last game where the A's ended up losing 10-7 to because of the bullpen. They jumped out to that 5-1 lead, and Blackburn's last start is a little deceiving. If you look at those numbers, you're going to say, oh, well, he really wasn't very good. He had one bad pitch where he gave up that two-run homer, and then he, he threw zeros right after that until he got taken out. And then you look at the Pineda side of things. I mean, this guy, he doesn't strike out people. He gives up runs and hits uh, at, at, at a big time rate. And you know, Pineda's not going to go more than five innings. It's funny here because we're talking about a total of seven here with, you know, uh, in, in an American League game, we would never, ever think about seven. We still have DHs here. I mean, that is an extremely low total. So I can see where you're going with that, Mark. And then as far as you go, Jeff, with, with Blackburn, you know, I like Blackburn uh, as well here. And I was all set to play this game with the A's because I said, okay, the A's have lost nine in a row. And if you go back, what, three of their last four games have been one-run losses. And we want to rip on the bullpen because that bullpen has been uh, awful. But if you go back to the the last three or four games, their bullpen has actually put up zeros. I mean, you know, they haven't given one game. They gave up an eighth inning uh, run. But before that, it was sixth inning or prior. So their bullpen has actually been pretty good over the last three or four starts. And I was all set to play Oakland. I said, OK, I'm going to snap this this nine game streak. They've come close. A lot of low scoring games. But the 
A's injuries have just got me concerned here. I mean, Lowry is back out again now. Piscotty's out. Uh, Voigt's out. So when you look at the the offensive lineup that the, the A's are putting out there, they just don't have much at the plate right now because they're decimated by injuries again. So that's the only thing that kept me off this game. But I was all set to play Blackburn uh, just like you, Jeff. But it kind of scared me off a little bit. So I'll definitely be rooting for the A's here, and then it'll be the woulda, coulda, shoulda. But uh, um, they're going to snap this streak. If not today, it'll be tomorrow. So anyway, we've got action in this game. Let's lock Jeff in for the Oakland A's with Paul Blackburn at plus 108. And base winner likes the over in this game of seven. All right, next up. The Miami Marlins taking on the Arizona Diamondbacks. Hernandez and Castellanos are on the hill in this game. And the Marlins are a $1.16 road favorite there at Chase Field. Total in this game is, is 8.5. It's funny, we got 8.5 over here in this game and a 7 with uh, uh, Detroit and Oakland. Uh, kind of strange. But uh, yeah, the totals have been a little bit mysterious so far uh, this year. Base winner, talk a little bit about the Marlins and your Diamondbacks. Yeah, I think there's some value here with the Marlins today. I mean, they're priced at minus 116 in the market. I've got it at minus 131. And then one of the things, and I'll get into my numbers, but one of the things, just from a stuff comparison, and, and Hernandez has not been electric. He's got a 40 percentile stuff plus, but Humberto Castellanos, 7 percentile stuff plus. It's it's the second worst on the board today. So I like that that's going for us as well. In fact, uh, my starting pitcher ratings has Castellanos with a 132 run suppression number, and that's 148th out of 150 pitchers. You look at the bullpen here, and, and this these are some interesting numbers. I've got Miami rated 13th in baseball by my long-term ratings, and the Diamondbacks at 30th in baseball by my long-term ratings. But one of the things that to me is pretty interesting when you take a look at just swinging strike percentage, hard hit per nine, and expected walk rate, is Miami rates really high this year. They're second in baseball uh, and right up, right below the, the Dodgers, which you wouldn't think when you combine all of those ratings together. And then if you look at Arizona, they're 22nd in baseball uh, by those ratings. So I think that we get an edge in the bullpen a decent size edge in the bullpen. The offenses I have about right. And one thing that I did want to say about this Arizona Diamondbacks team is if you look at the regular standings, you'll see that they're sitting above 500 at 15 and 14. But I have on my website, I've got an expected standings and it just takes into account weighted runs created plus X fit minus and defensive runs saved. And they should be based on those, those numbers, alone they should be 10 and 18 so they've really got about five more wins than they should have based on their underlying stats and if you look at their weighted runs created plus it's an 83 and their x fit minus is 115 and so i think as a as a whole you've got and this includes this bullpen which i just don't really like at all for arizona uh they're third worst in baseball just just ahead of the reds and the royals so for all those reasons i'm going to go with the marlins here and uh, lay a short price at minus 116. Okay, Jeff. Yeah, I, I think the number here is kind of telling me kind of all I need to know about this game. In a year where baseball has been so certain with unders, we obviously know. And I've talked about. It. I had an under last week with this Arizona team. Um, they're an under machine at home. However, you look at this number; it's went from eight to eight and a half in the market. Um, you know, I, I think all the signs tell you to take the under here, but I, I don't know. I mean, both these pitchers seem like pitchers that are going to give you know, four or five runs up, maybe, you know, three, four or five runs. Bullpens are going to come in and not clean them up. I don't like either of these starting pitches in Hernandez and or Cassianos. Mark kind of alluded to Cassianos is uh, uh, under arcing problems. I kind of feel like this is kind of one of those wild six, five type of games. Just, just my thought. And then again, these are not the greatest offenses in the major leagues. Arizona is not as bad as, as some, you know, they're not Detroit or Kansas city and you know, Miami's kind of middle of the pack in baseball. So I'm going to kind of lean on an over here. I think the numbers kind of telling just with these teams and the under uh, stuff and the fact that, you know, I think Arizona has the best under numbers in baseball at home. So I'm going to look and kind of feel like this at worst is, you know, give me a, give me a four, four game. That's all I need here uh, to get an over. So I'm, I'm going to lean on an over here. 
you know, it's kind of hard to to play Miami in this spot, guys, because Hernandez has been really bad. I mean, he gave up 13 runs in his last three starts. Castellanos really isn't much better. And you look at Miami, they've lost seven out of their last eight games. We were just talking about them going back a week and a half ago that this team, hey, uh, they're playing some good baseball as a surprise team. They won seven in a row. And then what do they do after that? They've won seven. Uh, they've lost seven of their last eight games. Hard team to figure. And like I said, Hernandez has just not, not been good to hear at all. Um, I, I'm a little surprised here. We're, we're not talking about maybe an over in this game. But uh, I, I don't want no part of this game. But uh, uh, base winner, you're on it. Good luck to you. And uh, hopefully uh, you, you knock this one out of the park. So let's mark, uh, lock Mark in for this one. As uh, he does like Miami minus 114. Uh, in this spot. All right, guys, uh, we will throw it out there to the uh, questions here. Make sure you hit us here in the in the chat room. Before we get to that, though, uh, a couple of the games um, that we I just want to touch on with you guys real quick here. The Dodgers are going to Pittsburgh uh, today, and Urias is uh, going against Quintana. I, I think it's kind of weird that none of us are, are on the Dodgers here today because uh, it, it really points – to a a Dodger victory. I know they had to travel. They're going, uh, playing an early game in Pittsburgh today, but I know all of us are are not crazy about Quintana and Urias. I've been on him the last couple of times. Um, is, is the price just scaring us off here, uh, from playing the Dodgers because they're a heavy, you know, plus $2 favorite. What, what held you back on it, TC? Cause I know you like Urias a little bit better than I do. I think just the, the, the fact that I, of what I said, I think, you know, maybe, maybe a little bit of the travel and, and, you know, again, uh, you know, just maybe not fully, fully trusting the spot, the situation. I think maybe that's it. Maybe coming off a big uh, weekend series and, you know, I don't know. I'm, I'm, I, and I think I looked at that price too. I said, well, if I'm going to play, this is probably going to have to be on the run line and they're a visitor, which is okay. I'm okay with that, but you're, you're really not getting that much value of laying the run and a half in this game too. So I just didn't feel very strong about it. Now, again, I love playing teams, good teams coming off losses. Maybe if Pittsburgh gets one today, then I'll be all over the Dodgers tomorrow, full disclosure. But I just wasn't that excited about this yeah. game. And I was kind of questioning myself. That's why I threw it out there to you guys. Should yeah, we be I, talking about and playing the Dodgers today? Well, for me, the line's minus 247. And I, I'm I'm not a big fan of Quintana, but but the, the concerns for me on Urias, I want to see him throw a little bit more from a command. I mean, he was an elite command guy. He was probably one of the top five pitchers uh, from a location standpoint last year. And uh, I, he doesn't have the greatest stuff. It's not bad. It's a 66 percentile stuff number. But again, like you got to kind of really love the spot. I think when you, when you're laying 223. And I'm kind of like you, where you were, TC. It's like I really don't love this spot, even though my the base winner line would suggest that it, that it does have value uh, by from a pricing standpoint. Jeff? Yeah, I'm not laying over 200. In fact, I would almost maybe lean on a pirate first five here. I, I have no interest in the Dodgers against lefties. I, I'm, I just don't. I mean, they're hitting 227 so far this season. Um, you know, those are seemingly numbers that that are going to continue. Throw in the fact that, as you alluded to, kind of an early start, kind of a weird uh, uh, scheduling spot. You know, off the the the, uh, the you know the long weekend. Now you got a, an earlier game in a you know place that you don't go that often. Yeah, I, I kind of like uh, you know Pirates first five here a little bit. You know, just being honest. I right. like I said, I'm no no I'm not backing the Dodgers when they play right. and face a lefty. Speaking of heavy favorites, one more game real quick to touch on. Uh, Texas is taking on uh, the Yankees today. John Gray against Nestor Cortez. Uh, The Yankees a heavy favorite in this game. And I'm not sure they should be this heavy of a favorite. You know, the Rangers have been playing some pretty good baseball of late. They've won five of their last six. I'm not crazy about uh, Cortez here at all. Do you think the Yankees should be this heavy of a favorite? I I think. Uh, Go ahead, Jeff. Sorry. No, no, I was just going to say, I actually kind of like the Yankees here. If I, I would more or less look towards a run line. We know their lineup can deliver. And I'm not saying that the Dodgers run, uh, line can't deliver either. But I, I just, you know, uh, you talk about a team that, that you know, is bad in Texas. They're another group that, that suck. They can't score runs right now. Uh, they're really struggling. We know the Yankees can score. I mean, they're, they're pushing five runs a game. Nestor Cortez has kind of been one of these young kind of surprises um, yeah, I, I mean, early start though, you know, that's, I, I'm not a big fan of these early day games Yeah, on Mondays. Yeah. 
Base one. I, I, I think it's priced where it needs to be. I've got it at minus one ninety nine. You know, they say it's nasty nester, but my 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 question to those who were who who say it's nasty nester, how nasty can the guy be when he has his stuff pluses in the twenty seventh percentile? Right. Come on, guys. But uh, anyway, both guys stuff plus 27 percentile. Huge edge uh, offensively for the Yankees. And you know how much I love that Yankees bullpen. So I think that you, while, while the starting pitchers uh, have them probably about equal, uh, you get the edge in the offense and the, and the relief for the Yankees. So that's kind of how that, when you put it in the mixer, that it comes up to minus 199. All right, there you go. Hopefully I hit a couple of those questions uh, from Kyle there. Uh, Mark uh, wants to ask, Mark, uh, base winner, what's your line today on the White Sox? Well, this is a tough this is a tough matchup for me. It's a good question because I've been really high on Copic, and he right now has enough data that he kind of qualifies to go into this other ratings pool, and it's really brought his number like way up in the rankings. So, I can't really like because I got conflicting numbers from when he was a reliever to when he's a starter. But, you know, TC, you said that these guys that that, uh, they try to these relievers that they try to make starters, sometimes it doesn't work out. And if you look at his three metric log, especially his last two two starts out, 10 percentile uh, versus the Royals. And he he only got a 7.4 percent swinging strike rate against the Royals. And then against the Cubs, I was backing Kopik. He only had a 7.2% swinging strike rate. So, uh, you know, I'm going to pass on this game. The, the, the base winner line would say to play Cleveland. But then the, uh, on the other side, you look at Copic stuff plus at 80 percentile and Plesak at 29 percentile. So I think that this is one for me, at least, where I have enough, you know, kind of conflicting data that it's, it's confusing for me. and I'm going to pass on it. Yeah. Jeff? Yeah, I don't have much in this one. I, these are, Listen, baseball could sometimes be pretty simple. You know, you have like a toss-up game like this. I'm going to just lean on the better pitcher. Uh, some kind of glaring thoughts, though, and there's one in particular. You know, I know, you know, Kopech, you know, he's been really good. You give him a lot of credit. But you look at him four starts, he's not gotten a win yet. That, that's kind of concerning, I feel like, for as good as he's pitched. That means, A, the bullpen's either blowing it or or they're not scoring any runs for him. That That's a bit concerning. I feel like he deserves better. Is he going to be mired in one of these, you know, Cole Hamels when he was with the Phillies where he would pitch every game, he'd give up a run or two, and you know, he'd find his, himself not getting wins because of it. So, yeah, I have a bit of concern here with that. But, yeah, I, I lean on Kopech. You're always going to get a good outing from him generally. Uh, but some of the, uh, the, you know, just a win-loss record kind of concerns me just because he doesn't have a decision. Which Yeah, you know, doesn't, it, you're talking about well, the guy doesn't have any wins. He doesn't have any losses either because, you know, uh, this guy's really not going deep into games as well too. And he's got a low ERA. And like we know, he does have good stuff. So it, it is kind of crazy. I mean, the White Sox are starting to play some good ball now. What They've won seven in a row. So – um, they're looking strong, but yeah, it, it's, it's harder to decipher, you know, for me at least, uh, in this game, uh, Alexi wants to know about the uh, Phillies in Seattle today. Some thoughts on that base winner. Yeah, this one, I, I almost played Philadelphia because I have it priced at Philly at minus 117. And then I thought about it. It's interesting. He brings up the, the double header and then they have to fly West. And I just don't want to use, uh, I just don't want to play Philly with because they they had to use the bullpen quite a bit yesterday. And I, when I play Philadelphia, at least on a full game, I want to make sure that I'm I'm getting Knebel, I'm getting Sir Anthony, and I know Familia. I like Familia, but baseball hipsters don't. But uh, Sir Anthony pitched yesterday, struck out. He walked two guys, struck out the side in the first game, and they used Knebel to close that out. So I mean, they're they're. I just I I got to be really comfortable with the bullpen usage on Philly. And that's why I passed on it. I mean, Philadelphia, I think, got better days ahead of them. If you look at their hard hit metrics, they're really good compared to what they've produced. And, and uh, you know, I look for that team to, to go on the rise. I'm not a huge fan of Chris Flexen, and that's kind of why I have it priced this way. But a tough spot for me uh, for Philly. Good spot for uh, Seattle, Jeff, you think, or what? Yeah, I, I think it is. I mean, th- this the truth of the matter is, and Mark, Mark might be right as far as the long-term stuff on Philadelphia, but right now this team is – not playing well. I mean, you look at that other night, they blew that uh, that save, you know, the seven-run game. 
Yeah, they came back and won the next night, but you know they lose yesterday six one. I mean they were they were pretty dominated, quite frankly. Uh, even after I think taking a one nothing lead after uh, Bryce Harper uh, or no, I think they I think it was two one. But either way, still they, they didn't respond. I mean they've been absolutely atrocious from the plate occasionally, uh, and they got ahead. You know out to Seattle. That's about as far as you can go uh, coming right off what they did. It's just not a good spot to me. And look, I think Flexen's one of the you know, good parts of Seattle. So, and, and as many know, I'm not a big Seattle guy. So yeah, I think it's a tough spot for, for the Phillies. Plus Ranger Suarez on the mound. Yeah, not great. Ranger Suarez comes across to me as like the Kyle Kendrick of this team. Kyle Kendrick was a guy that they throw out there as a five ERA guy every five days, a couple of years ago. And you know, he didn't pitch well, and they would be surprised, and everyone would say, well, he he's not a good pitcher. So, yeah, I, I would lean Seattle. I think it's a pretty good play on them. All right. Um, any thoughts uh, regarding the Cubs and Padres today? Uh, Gore going against uh, the uh, Kyle Hendricks uh, uh, today in this game. So we've got a couple questions uh, on that game. Uh, also, uh, San Francisco later on tonight against the Rockies. We know the Rockies have struggled big time against the Giants. Um Couple uh, couple heavy favorites there, especially the Giants game. Any thoughts, guys, on on either one of those? I'm kind of, uh, and I'm I'm going to throw this out there as kind of a, a thought here. I, I, you know, I think for the going, you know, c- continued, you know, going time that we have this show until you know August or whatever that is or whatever the show ends, I, I might just play against Colorado on the road uh, and bet them at home and play their team total at home. I think I'm going to have a lot of success doing that. This Colorado team sucks on the road; they just do. Um, you know, Radon, I mean, he's kind of been a, a, a mystified heir, if you will. I mean, go on MLB.com and look at this guy's, like, stock photo. I mean, he looks like a, a guy that guzzles a couple beers before his start. But, you know, you know, there he is pitching very well. Uh, this Rockies team just a different team on the road. Uh, and, yeah, I, I think that the going thought is a lot of the time in baseball, don't complicate it. They're just not a good team on the road, and they're playing against a pretty good pitcher and a good team here. So I lean Giants. Are, TC, are you showing a seven on this Cubs Padres game? Because that's what I have it currently yes. at. Yes. I, I just think that's too seven and low. a half. Actually, Mark, seven and a half. Yeah, even at seven and a half, I think it's a bit bit low for Hendricks and Gore. I mean, I don't know. I mean, I've I've got Hendricks at 136 out of 150 pitchers. He he's never really been a great stuff guy. He's got an eight percent stuff plus metric, and then Gore like the people are high on him, but he's got, only got a 60 percent stuff plus. I think if I had to play this game, I think I'd I'd play the over. And that kind of goes back to, I think that when we look at the at the home run environment in, in San Diego at the end of the year, I think we're going to find that that the humidor that they've installed. Is gonna is gonna increase home run numbers in uh, you know for for this year's output. So I'm looking for that to kind of I, I know that it, that it hasn't come to fruition yet this year, but I think that long term for the season at least it will. So I, I would play the over here. I just I can't Hendricks and Gore seven and a half. Uh. All right, uh, one more we'll hit uh, real quick here uh, regarding Chris Woodward. Uh, he's not going uh, today, but. Uh, Thoughts about Chris Woodward, a base winner. What what does his numbers look like to you? I don't know who, who which which team does he even play for. I don't even know who he is. Yeah, <laughs> you can go ahead and take that one then, Jeff. <laughs> I don't either, actually. Yeah. So I, that that's that. No, listen. He, that, I think he managed. Doesn't he? Isn't he the manager for the? Uh, for Chris the, Woodward. I mean, he he was pitch. He was a Seattle pitcher there for a while. Wasn't I thought, he? I thought, he was the isn't right he the now. coach? Isn't he the manager for the yeah. for the Rangers? I don't know. Okay. There you go. All right, guys. Uh, good stuff. Let's take a look at our best bets uh, for today. Like I said, not a really deep card. And when we're looking at it from a pitching perspective today, overall, I mean, you got Rodon that's pitching today. He's been pretty much lights out. But again, you know, three and one record right now. Last start wasn't overly great. But for the most part, you got a lot of guys who are getting some spot starts here, some some middling pitchers, as I like to say. So I think a lot of us are, are, are not really crazy about the the card in general today. At least I'm not. So Jeff's going back with the A's today. They've lost nine in a row. He's going to take uh, Paul Blackburn plus 108. Uh, and the base winner is actually going to be on that game as well. He's going to take the over in that game, hoping for some runs between two teams that have combined for 14 straight losses here. The Tigers have lost five in a row. Oakland has lost nine in a row, over seven for base winner there. And uh, he's also going to take a shot with the Marlins at minus 114 in their contest today uh, at Arizona. And I will uh, go with the Milwaukee Brewers today. 
uh, banking on a good performance from Brandon Woodruff today against Castillo, who will be on a pitch count against the lowly Cincinnati Reds. So there you go. All right, guys, uh, some final uh, thoughts as uh, we uh, start off this uh, new week here on this Monday. Yeah, yeah, I'll, I'll I'll hit on Chris Woodward. So he's a, he's the manager for the for the Rangers. Kind of caught caught me off guard. I was like, wait a second, this guy's the manager. Yeah. I think he was talking. So he he mentioned yesterday that Glaber Torres hit a fly ball that that left the Yankee Stadium. It was a typical Yankee Stadium home run, and he he made it. He made a statement like, well, he hit a home run in a little league park, and so I think that that's that's what Kenny's alluding to. But I think Woodward's a good guy. That's why they've kept him around, and and I think he keeps a positive environment in in that clubhouse. And it's I think it was hard to do last year with the talent that they had. But uh, yeah. I mean, hey, that's Yankee Stadium. I think that's I think that that like. You have to accept that you you play in Yankee. Your guys had the same thing, but you guys your guys couldn't hit fly balls that went out of Yankee Stadium either. So I I can I can see uh, I can see why he's kind of upset that the, the the ball left the yard. But at the same time, man, why didn't your guys hit fly balls that left the yard? Well, I think you know Kenny's asking the question, why is he so soft? In other words, I think he likes seeing a little more more fiery in this situation instead of just kind of like you know that. I guess that's that's where the question is coming from. I don't know. I hear you. All right, yeah. All right, Jeff. Final uh, thoughts here. Yeah, I really just wanted to comment on something, and, and I'm actually going to talk about this in my podcast this week, but I think, uh, TC, this is something that I think you may be interested in. Uh, recently, the reservoir at Lake Mead uh, is a lake, which is out in Nevada, it continues to plunge, and they're starting to discover bodies in oil drums and things of that nature. Um, it's important to understand that in 1971, an individual left Chicago called Tony Spalatro. Tony Spalatro moved to Las Vegas. Uh, and he became uh, the individual that would be portrayed in Casino, Nicky Santoro. That is a real character. He's called Tony Spalatro. The murder rate in Las Vegas actually rose exponentially just when Tony Spalatro uh, came to Las Vegas. It's probably likely that many of the bodies that will be found in Lake Mead have something to do with Tony Spalatro. Now, there's nothing we can do. Tony Spalatro was killed in 1986. But uh, when he became a, a player in Vegas, uh, bodies started to turn up. Uh, and there's probably many that haven't turned up, and we're starting to maybe see them now. Jeff, it sounds like a field trip for you to come to Las Vegas, and I will take you out to Lake Mead, uh, not over, uh, get, you know, give you the overlook, but maybe take you down there as well, too, and even give you a tour of the Hoover Dam if you'd like, Jeff. Well, there, listen, I'm sure there's some bodies in there as well, some of which <laughs> maybe were workers or something like that, but Tony Spotcher kid a lot of people. I mean, one of the probably biggest lunatics in mafia history, so yeah, I, I, it wouldn't surprise you, and most of the bodies that are turning up have a, a shelf life of probably mid-70s, that kind of time, so yeah, it would be very surprising to me if those aren't mob-connected. Uh, there's a lot of bodies buried out in those deserts and in those reservoirs, I'd imagine. Base winner is going to his computer right now, trying to figure out the uh, the dead body rate in Lake Mead, uh, c c comparing to how we factor this into pictures. It's next crazy. Start. That sounds like it just sounds like an East Coast guy that's like he's used to like disposing of bodies and bodies of water, and it's like, wait a second, you've got this depth. Just go in the desert, and nobody will see it. That the coyotes will get it. And so, but he just couldn't get off that. I'm dumping the body, the the body in the water. Because that's the way I've done it all my life, I guess. And I think this work too. I mean, you go to the desert here, especially you know in the summertime. I mean, it, it's hard to dig into that sand and that, that that dirt, you know. So it's easier to go with the water, right? Jeff? No, it's also yeah, it's a lot easier to to use water. I mean, all you gonna need is a couple weights. You weigh it down. But the thought is, I mean, if if you know, look, I you know, I wasn't even a thought in the seventies. But the truth is, I mean, if I lived back in those times, I thought of oh, the water's gonna go down. I mean, th that's not gonna happen. You don't think the things like that, right. you know, just the crazy things happen and we've destroyed our planet to the point of where this is starting to happen. So yeah, to me, I've always said you want to get rid of a body. Um, and many, I've learned this in, in, in what I do with this show. Um, there's a guy, Sonny Franzese, who talked about when you kill someone, uh, you need to dismember them and put them in acid. That's the biggest way. Or just, uh, you know, you, you got to think of that stuff. You take the half hour, get rid of the body. It's a lot easier uh, than, than letting it turn up. I would either throw it in the ocean or uh, use acid. So that would be my thought. But yeah, I, burying it would be a good idea as well. Because, But then it's a lot more work. That takes a long time to dig, dig holes like that, especially heavy sand and, and, you know, who knows what else is out there. All right. And for more details on that from that manual by Jeff Nadu, go to his his podcast and check that out. He'll have more how on to that. dismember bodies. Yeah. <laughs> well, I, 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 remember, this is just uh, 
from what I've heard from other people that have done this, I, that that were known uh, and admitted killers. That this is, not, I'm not telling you my personal opinions here on this. But Lake Me definitely a concern uh, drying up. There's no question yeah. about that here. Yeah. All right, guys, have yourself a good one. We appreciate everyone for joining us. Remember, like and subscribe to the channel here at uh, BetUS TV, America's favorite sports book at uh, BetUS. And of course, like our show here as well. Monday through Friday, 12 noon Eastern, handicapping the baseball card for you each and every day. For base winner, Mark Borchard, Jeff Nadu, TC Martin saying so long. Have yourself a good one. We'll catch you tomorrow at noon.